understand that to go to war, you don't just jump up, grab anything I found. I just go, jumped up, grabbed something I found. I just, as I ran out, the people took off running. No, the people took one look at your hand, saw you were holding a belt, and ran towards you faster. That's what really happened. All you heard is the belt. So when, at first, when, eh, uh, not belt, too. Eh. And that was the end of Solomon Grundy. Is that what you came to a war with? Do you know how they prepare for war? They take time. They develop weapons. All the major advances on this earth, most of them were created for war. These devices you hold. Human beings were fighting each other. And because they want to win the other side, they develop things very fast. They push you. People are not nice. They say, oh, how is your experiment, sir? Well done. Oh. No. I say, oh, I'm looking for money to, to, to develop the experiment further. That's in times of peace. In times of war, the government hears that you're developing something that can do pow. And people drop. Then you came up with the one that was pow, 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 pow. Then you came. Dr. Fabian, the United States government would like you to work for us. We're giving you here by the sum of $100 million. And if you need more, tell us. Do you need help? We'll give you 50 workers. During war, you, you, you have zero problems. Zero. They will fund you. If what you're creating is kills people, the more it kills, the better. That's how war works. If it's a device that can defeat the enemy, it's Christians that stand up, zero preparation, nothing at all. Let's go. Don't mind them. They don't know what we are, who we are. <laughs> they are joking. <laughs> hey, shut up, Adam. In fact, they don't believe in tongues, so there's no shut up. Just go. Then you come back looking like a dog with your tail between your legs. That's if you come back. You know how many battles Christianity has gone for and lost? You have no clue. All over the earth, we are losing battles constantly. You see, if you're of that category that believes, ah, they don't know who God is. I agree with you. Our God is powerful. But our God oftentimes is like, no man, no man, no one, young or old, I can't find anyone. I can't find anyone. I searched and couldn't find a man to stand in the gap. Oh, man. I guess the enemy will have to take this round. Now, we know in the end, God wins. The ultimate battle will be won by God. We have it. It's called prophecy, scriptures. We know. What about the skirmishes in between? People are losing many battles constantly. Because, number one, you don't even know how to fight. That's where Bible study comes in. That's why we study the Bible a lot. Because this is where you get the strategy. This is how you learn to fight. And the number one way to learn to fight is to live a righteous life. Oh, the ultimate weapon of society. Breastplate of righteousness. Truth. You avoid lies. The word of God. Sword. Peace with God and man. Hope as a helmet. Shield of faith. Which comes from hearing the word of God. Praying with all prayer for one another. Standing with one another. Two are better than one. Three. All the wisdom of scripture put together. Is your greatest defense first. Then the strategy for attacking is not just prayer. It is speaking. It's words like swords. It's spears and arrows of the righteous. All these are actions you carry out with the foundation of gear. Spiritual gear. This doesn't come. So you can be prepared. You can live a prepared life every day. As you go to tell that sister, I'm very sorry for what I said to you this morning. I apologize. Do you forgive me? That is spiritual warfare. You see, but most people have no clue of these things. Your idea of spiritual warfare is gather in the morning. Pray! Kata, kata. No water. Kata, kabuda, teta. You pray. Pull down your enemy. Pull him down. Pull him down. Die by fire. Die by fire. Die by fire. Say 500. Die by fire. Die by fire. Die by fire. Die by fire. Okay. You're laughing, it's you. Any of you, you're all over this place. So far ahead, you have suffered in this world. May the Lord heal you. Amen. Now, if you know what I'm saying is true, most of you came here. You didn't see me, not once. 
You have not seen us do prayer. You've seen us pray. When we pray, you don't even notice we are praying. You don't even notice. But the battles are being won. Dum, 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 dum. How come those battles you fought, all those things that pressed you, all those things seem to just disappear? The victories were won without following the method you thought were the method which you followed, which fell. How? How did victory over diseases, all sorts of things happen while we were gisting and laughing and repenting? How did it happen? Because primary warfare is what I've told you. And we don't know this. The primary warfare for your marriage, for everything, is the same. So you can take care of 50% of the war preparation, 60% by your daily life of righteousness, doing God's will. Then the rest, that extra, well, you guys need to get together and pray. That's why you can come together for one, two, three days to pray about something and it's resolved. It's not because you're so wonderful. No, it's because you live prepared. Unfortunately, Christians think the way to prepare starts when we call a fast. No, that is the remaining 10%. We just need to tidy up, mop up the battle. The others that you, is your daily life. I found out from the word and practice that if you teach people to live a right, if you live righteously, avoid sin and all that. You've already done most of the warfare. You're a, you're a warrior. You're protected and the enemy is already scared of you in a significant way. That won't stop him from attacking you. They attack everyone. They attack Jesus. There's nobody. Satan goes, oh, okay, let's, it's, let, let's leave. No, no, no. If you're in this earth, trouble will come after you. The prince of this world comes. He has not your me. That's Satan. Jesus said that. If he didn't say it, people would be running around saying, no, it's not true. It's true. Jesus said the prince of this world is coming. The ruler of this world. He's come. The archon of this world. They come. And he has nothing on me. Because that's the primary defense. The absence of anything. When he comes, I, ah, I see my property. I saw a movie. Someone uh, sh sh watch. I don't know. Is the only part one that is uh, the assassins. Well, I've seen it. So on YouTube. It's Nigerian. Uh, I don't know. Badage, I saw a name like that. You can copy it out of this system when you, when, uh, if you ask me, I'll show you. I'll give it to you. So you can collect it. Go and watch it. The assassins. Um, so it's a, a short thing. It's not complete short. But the little, you know, even though the person, how they hooked me to watch it, they said, ah, this is like Pierre. From Peretti's This Present Darkness. Where's that other Justin? If I catch you, eh? If I catch you, you buy me uh, meat pie. <laughs> so I opened it and watched it. You, you see, when you watch it, they tried. They tried. I wish they did, but they tried. They were showing the physical and the spirit realm. That's the that's the connection. If you've read, who has read this person, Present Darkness, Present Darkness by Frank Pretty, you should read it. It's a novel, but very real, very solidly written, very real. It's a novel, and like watching a movie. Now, they show the physical realm, then they show the spirit realm, what's happening behind, you know, how the demons are planning, how they, so it's good. It's a good thing. It's a good, well-made thing. My point is, that's reality. That thing couldn't be more real. That what that movie shows. That's exactly how things are happening. At least as per the planning. I've told you many times. You think the average human being thinks things are just happening. Nothing is just happening. Oh no, it's random events. No, it's not. No, don't wait till you see your file. In the kingdom of darkness. You see, you've been we have been bamboozled. Though. <laughs> we are in a you were born into a battlefield you were born into it you were born your mother brought you out on top they, they're, sh they're shooting fire everywhere boom bam bombs you were born inside it you're a child of war now you want no no see see please that's not what I'm here for me, see this me I want peace it's not possible sir it's not possible. It's not. It's not like your. It's not possible. 
okay, if it's what, stand on top of a tree and shout, peace, silence. Let there be peace everywhere. Let everybody behave, including your parents. They won't. In fact, you, you will not behave. So it's not how it works. Now, we would like to say, no, but with Jesus, with, when Jesus came, did he remove you? Didn't you read what Jesus said? He said, I am not asking that you take them out of the world, John 17, but that you keep them. And he says, clearly, the world will hate you. You hear that, you're like, it's not my portion. Your master said, a servant is not greater than his Lord or a disciple than his master. If they've done it to me, they'll do it to you. You say, it's not my portion. Are you real? It's, your, it's all our portion. War, man that is born of woman. We are born for trouble. Job said, we are in trouble. So how must we do? Do we walk around miserable? No, I've told you, it's better to do it while laughing. It's better to be smiling in trouble. You know, in the movies, the guy that is smiling and acting casually, they're very good at shooting. Do you understand? The guy who is good, warrior, and is not, you don't have to be so... <laughs> That's not a happy life. Instead, learn how to use weapons so thoroughly that even though you look very relaxed, you're very alert. Do you understand? You're sensitive. You're picking stuff. You're aware. Don't, you don't have to be miserable. That's my approach. I've told you years ago, I told you, let, let's be laughing while shooting. Do you understand? What's wrong with that? Must we be crying? It doesn't help. It makes the enemy feel strong. So let's be light. Well, so there's a reason why I hardly ever make, make people fast. That's why you've, you've almost never, you've been here for years and you're wondering this church, do we ever fast? Because the primary thing you develop and why I tell you keep coming is getting rid of what the enemy had on you. Focus on that. And there's not a need to do many other things. But when you have the enemy's property, seven, stuck into you, and that's just the front, behind is there, three more. You have to soak into in, in bleach now and vinegar in a hurry as he's coming. That's why you should fast for 50 days. How will you not fast for 50 days? You're, you're, you're loaded with his nonsense, so you have to soak enough, enough, enough bleach. Maybe the thing will fall out. In, 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 in 45 days. Then you engage with the enemy on the 50th day and you stand a chance. But if you live a life like Jesus did, free of the enemy's property, no compromise. The enemy doesn't come to you, all the exams you cheated, all the things you lied, you're a thief. All your life is wrong. And it's like, it, isn't this one of us? We say, no, it's a child of God. This one. It's okay. What about my property here now? I've come. I have how many things? I have? Ten things. Good. Ten. All right. Attach ropes to those ten things. Yank. So they pull. And off you go. Because he has things on you. I therefore focus as a minister of the gospel. Because this is how the true gospel teaches it. Let not such a thing be named amongst you. And they give you a list. Sexual immorality. None. Don't. Impurity. Mm -mm. These are the things you focus and get rid of. 100%. It says put it to death. Ephesians 5. Colossians 3. Put it to death. Destroy it completely. First Thessalonians 4. Scrub. Scrub. None. He said kill it. It's not everything you kill alone. To kill something you may need help. Most times you need help to kill something because the thing fights for its life. You kill it, crush it completely. Give no room. Then you also check. Can you be angry and sin not? Ephesians 4, yes. Does the Bible say be angry and sin not? But he says also in Colossians 5, get rid of anger, rage, and he gives you other things because those things can open the door to sin. You can be angry and not sin, but if you keep being angry, you will sin. Do you understand? If you allow that anger stay overnight, why does it say, don't let anger stay overnight? Ephesians 4, and roll over to the next day. Why does it say that? Because if anger stays overnight, it starts to become what's called a grudge. 
and unforgiveness is born. You can be angry with someone and there's, not, there's no issue of forgiveness and unforgiveness. But keep that anger. Just keep it. It will hatch like a chick. And become a... a, a now, you, now you have a problem. Now you have a problem. Terrible thing. Terrible, terrible, terrible thing. Let me say it because I think someone needs it. Yeah, last time we had talked about it at night devotions when we give thanks for the, in the day. We praise God. What we do in my at night devotions in my house, we call it uh, Thanksgiving. You know, we just give thanks. People give thanks. I have a law. If three people or four have something to say, you may wait. But if we don't have a quorum of at least, at least three people, then everybody will give thanks. So I really like it when we don't have up to three people. So everybody gives thanks. Everybody, you'll be shocked at how nobody had anything to thank God. How they how they keep talking when they start. You know, the human heart is beautiful, really wicked. <laughs> the seed <pool. laughs> So so they give me that. When we got talking about how some of this ridiculous, someone said a test one, and and I interrupted and started talking about how um you don't have a problem with someone, but your friend or someone. But you didn't talk to them. And inside, you passed. And you wonder, that one didn't even say hi to me. And passed. He said, me too. I'm not saying hi to them. There's no problem. And then the thing goes on to become something. And two weeks later, you're like, how did this start? And everybody's waiting for the other person to reach out. Who has this happened to before? Don't let me jog your memory like the people in my house. The people in my house were trying to say, eh, I don't know. I said, ah, stop. If you tried. I, started, I, went, I would have finished them one by one. I would... You don't even know yourself. Now, excuse me. What? Who has ever thought of it? What kind of rubbish is that now? There was no problem. It's not that anyone... But here is a full grown. And you still doubt there's a devil in this world. The, Satan is real. Though. The, this is not the one that you did something. Nobody did anything. But everybody is waiting. Let me see you be the first two. And then after a while, you're angry at them. Why should they not... Dead? And it keeps growing. And then you hear people say things that we used to be friends, but oh man, the foolish girl. What happened? Nothing. No, something happened. The devil, he saw he couldn't get you to quarrel, so he, he used nothing to create a quarrel. How much more if you gave him something? Then he could really do more. Without petrol, a fire is burning. Imagine if you gave him petrol. Now, I am saying that thing you experienced, that, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Now there's the worst one, the one where they actually did something against you and you kept it. So the devil knows that unforgiveness is one of the best embedded things he has in people's lives. Yeah, he embeds it there. What I was saying earlier at the beginning about fathers and all that, he embeds it. He, 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 he slides it under there and you bury it and you forget it. The thing sits there. When the time comes, he can use that and start cancer successfully. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The raw material for cancer, that's at the top. Unforgiveness. Uh -uh. Unbeliever doctors, doctors in foreign countries that don't go to church or believe in God, developed what they call forgiveness therapy, where you forgive people that you're bitter again because they realized that people all over had cancer, that they're bitter. Yes, unbelievers, people that don't go to church. Imagine, imagine how real it is then. They start saying, use forgiveness therapy. Then we Christians, whom the God of all the earth has given all the secrets to life, things that pertain to life and godliness, we despise it. We throw it aside. We are casual. We don't know what we have. Christians don't know what we have. Your greatest preparation for warfare is not praying and fasting. It is the life you live daily. It's your daily life. Follow peace with all men. And holiness or separation from the world. Without which no man can see God. That's what the book of Hebrews say. So follow as much as lies with you. Hebrews 12. As much as lies with you, live peaceably with all men.
as it's in your power. Child of God, you want to win warfare? If you, you know, again, there are people that have come here over the years and you wonder, why don't we pray more? You funny being. Ask yourself, how many of your spiritual battles have you overcome? If you've overcome more of your spiritual battles, the longer you stay here, what do you say you want again? You see, your brain tells you that there's a way to do warfare. The way to do warfare, I focus on the primary foundational way of warfare. A righteous life is the most effective. People from every kind of spiritual background come here and their spiritual life gets better. From every kind, from the most powerful Jim Jim to the most prayerful, and they come and have victories that they have never had as the word just keeps going forth. It's the entrance of the world, the unfolding of the world that gives light and understanding. When light comes in, darkness cannot comprehend it. Not when energy comes in. Now, when it's time to pray, by the grace of God, we listen to and pray as we should. So you do the primary thing. The primary way you raise a warrior from when he's a baby is not by putting his, uh, 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 um, teaching him to shout, charge, and ride a horse. He's too small to ride a horse. He's a baby. The primary way you prepare that warrior is to feed him. Feed the child. Feed the child. Educate the child. Feed the child. Feed the child. Feed the child. Up to a certain stage. Then you adjust. Educate the child. And then, after a certain stage, give the child duties and responsibilities. And then, going forward, teach him teamwork. Then, there's all these levels. And you might say, what has this to do with anything? It has everything to do with being a good warrior, a good soldier. You need to know how to calculate. You need to know north, south, east, and west. You need to take orders. I've told you before about why soldiers are constantly marching. It's the most basic way they train you to work with a team and to obey others. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. Why do they do that all the time in military barracks? Who grew up in a military barracks? Do they march up and down? You didn't see them marching on? Answer that. Yes, I'm not talking about where they march. I mean, they march. Of course, it can only be in the paragraph. It's in your parlor. They match habitually. All your life, you've seen them matching. Why do they keep matching? It's, they say it's the most important part of their training. Now, how is this winning a battle? Think, think. How, how, how does this win a battle? Doing this. Is it not for children on 1st October? <laughs> Let, that's exactly the best way you prepare a soldier to obey commands. Forward, left, right. That constant acting like you're not reasoning to the command of another person plants inside your head the most important rule of warfare, which is obedience. Attack! No normal person runs towards bullets. No normal person here. And they say, forward! And you go forward. Nobody. Everything in you says, retreat! But after years of obeying, do you understand? Mindless obedience. You can do anything. You understand. Now, where will you learn marching? When you're Christianity, you came straight from an unbeliever to a believer, and you never learn obedience. That's why the person you pity the most is the Christian who has not learned obedience. Defeat is unavoidable. Because you will not be able, you don't know how to obey commands. You have no authority over your head. They cannot give you an identity. They can't tell you, do this. I want you working with these three people. You guys are in charge of this responsibility. That inability to be under authority. Since nature does not allow vacuums, the enemy will step in and put you under his authority. There's nothing in this world that, that must not be under authority. So when Jesus said, the prince of this world comes. He has nothing on me. He can't command me to do anything. He has no hold, no authority. He can't say left or right to me. That's what he meant. 
So if you are like, I don't obey them in my church when they say left, 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 right. I don't obey. I stand still. You don't understand. The enemy has said stand still. You're obeying someone. Everybody's obeying someone. There's no vacuum, empty space. All those things you think is you, is not you. There's the other voice. It's always contrary. Um, don't eat of this tree. That voice that says, nah, you may eat it. So she ate it. And Romans chapter 6 happened to her. Whomsoever you yield yourself, servants to obey, that person's servant you are. So who you obey, that is your commanding officer. Therefore, wise people are very meticulous about obedience. And you go into the scriptures, identify the commands of your God, and respond to him left, 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 left. Now, the more you do that, I'm getting to the point, when the times for battle come, yes? Remember, you were doing the daily, mindless, purposeless. I don't even know what we do this for. They say we should march. Uh, let's go. Today's huh. an But you're not talking. Private, yes. Fall out. <laughs> Give me 20. One, two. Do you sir, why? What? Do soldiers ask why they should do 20 push-ups? It's mindless. That's what they are trying to put you. Did you come here to gossip like little girls? No, sir. Yes, sir. No, sir. <laughs> Fall in line. Yes, sir. Left. Right. Left. That's how they handle you talking during parade. Nobody, it's not long detail. Even if they were wrong, it still doesn't matter. Even if they made a mistake. <laughs> soldiers are the most precise. Even more soldiers knew God. You'd have the best set of Christians from among the military. The ability to obey. Why do you think God has very few soldiers? Because we don't understand that we are called. The Bible calls it the obedience of faith. Now, people say, I have faith. Mm -mm. Where's the obedience? You claim you have faith. Where's the obedience that goes with it? Faith is shown in obedience. So, have you met Abraham? Faith is shown in obedience. It's obedience. Look at it. Romans 1 5. Read. Through him and on behalf of his name, we receive grace and apostleship to call all those among the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. What comes from faith? Obedience. Then you, have you heard the doctrine that says when you come to Jesus that you're free? That is not rules. That is not a life of rules. That is not rules. Excuse me. Can you hear the word obedience and there's no rule? What do you obey? Is it not rules people obey? Now we love to talk about faith. If anyone tells you that they have faith and you can't see a lifestyle of obedience, they be lying, bro. They are lying. Because faith without works is dead. It is dead. It's false. Obedience. How I know someone has faith. He said, show me your faith without works and I'll show you my faith by my, by my works, by my deeds. That's how I know someone has faith. How do I know a person that has faith? Do they have this extra obedient life? That's a person with faith. That one trusts the Lord. One said, no, no, I trust the Lord to provide. That's why I'm lying down here. No, you have no faith, sir. Obedience comes by faith. If there's the presence of faith, there will be the presence of obedience. Oh, may you understand this. Oh, may you believe the scriptures. So if you have a lifestyle of obeying God day to day, then trouble comes and the Lord says, my children, seek me. Call on my name. Why do I need to go on a 50-day fast, a 100-day fast, a 60-day fast, a 40-day fast, a 21-day fast, if 
Except the Lord told me, go on a 21-day fast. Except the Lord said, go on a 40-day fast. If it's the Lord that said it, fine and good. If the Lord said nothing of the sort, what I should have done is have a lifestyle of obedience. Are you understanding? Then on the day there's trouble, as, as we went out for a normal parade, my day-to-day -day life of obedience, he says, I'd like you to talk to her. I'd like you to pray for someone. Say this, you spirit of confusion, I command you to take your hands off her. Now, in the name of Jesus. Okay, that's it. Is that all? Uh, well, I want you to say till it, you see it leave. Sometimes you have to do that. Come out. Leave her. It will be in the walk, in the normal obey, 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 obey. That obedience has prepared you for war. So when there's battle, you are already 95% ready. It's just this act. Lift your arm, arms, point, fire. Brr. This act, you've been shooting all these times in practice. This action you carried out now is an act that is in line with your years, your time of training. You didn't stand up one, oh, do you know I was faced with battle? Do you know I suddenly became a soldier? You don't stand a chance. I've told you in all the world wars, civilians die the most. Mm -hmm. Civilians are the ones that die the most. Shouldn't it be soldiers who went out to fight? No, because when we one soldier with a gun, one enemy show, soldier shows up and is carrying a gun, and there are 50 of you men, you're still hopeless, useless. None of you has a weapon, none of you has a training. None of you has the boldness to pick and shoot. It took a long time to drill that into that person. So that person has learned war. The ability to act. Practice has a great part. You see a servant of God that is even backsliding. He's backsliding. He's still acting. From, from years of acting. Taking action. He can still, and he may be taking wrong action, but he's still taking. He's bold in taking. He can be teaching error. He's still open and stand and take that. You, you're still struggling to open your mouth and preach to one person. You've been planning it. It's just that you have not completed making this sign fully. But the person has been doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. Can find it easy to do. Hey, hi. I like to talk with you guys. You just take up. It's not that they are better people than you. It's just that they've been doing A soldier has been made to do Many things. That, thing. that obedience is what makes you the most prepared. And if you have been obeying God, His word, ah, then battles, many a battle will be won. Great battles may be won through your leading. You may be given to command others, lead others. You'll achieve much based on what you had been taught because you tend to train them as you were trained. If you disregard the basics when, that's, when there is peace, when war comes, spiritual battles, all that, you will not be prepared because all that running, those periods of long meetings that you did not learn, uh, it will come over now. So now what this situation in front of you needs is two hours of prayer. You have never prayed more than 10 minutes. That's a challenge. You have never prayed more than 10 minutes. So how on earth are you going to? Are you going to pray for two hours? You have never, you know, <laughs> whatever. So when we had the NMPG prayer or anything, there are times we had prayers that lasted for, how many days was that? In 20 something, 18. It was in different groups. Different groups were praying. It was 200 and something days. Or sometimes online, you know, we are putting our prayer points for hundreds of days. Or we are meeting as a group to pray for 50 days or 40 days. A group of people. We are doing all of that. All of that is stretching you. It's called capacity. Capacity is being created in you. 
That's what soldiers have. They have capacity. They can lie down in a bush for four days. Sleep in the bush. Their life is rough and tough. But that preparation is what equips them. That one soldier can be a terror to 200 men. Fall in line. Come and fall in line. Mr. Man, I will shoot you. Fall in line. One soldier with a weapon, who has learned weapon, who has acquired a weapon and knows how to use it, is more dangerous than very many human beings. If there are two, you're finished. If there are five, if there are ten, what made them so different? The training, the weapon. In the same way, if we get the training and the weaponry, the weapons of our warfare that are not physical, I would encourage all of you at some point to make sure you go to the Gamka School of Ministry series on spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. If you will get ready, it will serve you greatly. So the Lord allows circumstances that help us get ready. Some people resist it completely. Say, God, no, 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 I'm not ready for this. And he says, it's okay, civilian, you can go home. And he excludes them from the army. Many, that, most people are civilians. And the enemy takes them down many times. Say, no, but I'm a child of God. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The Satan attacked your, your king, Jesus. So he will attack you. Peter, yes. Simon, yes. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. I've prayed for you. That your faith will not fail, cease, finish. That it will not drain completely. You still have some faith left. And he sieved him. So the Lord Jesus was allowed to see what Satan petitioned for upstairs. Came and told Peter. I thank God it's the Lord Jesus that said it. Who is Peter? His right hand man. Yeah. But as a child of God, now there are those that rush and say, no, that was before the cross, this after. I don't think you've met any human being. Have you met people? Oh, people are being saved daily. What ever since? Okay, don't, don't answer. Just know it. If you have not been saved, people are being saved. People are being attacked. People are going through trouble constantly. Believe it. You better believe it. I know when Jesus died on the cross, that was over. Which world did you check in from recently? Mars. People, Christians, servants of God, everybody is being seen thoroughly. Some a little, some very harshly, some barely, some are such warriors that they, they act like it doesn't even matter. Let's go on. You must know this. You must understand that there is a war we are in. There is battles to be fought. And there's victories to be won. If you roll over and play dead, even if the enemy thought you were dead and passed you, what about others that you're responsible for? So we should learn to fight. This is true Christianity. What do I think? I think that the Lord would want us to know that everything I've said now applies to every aspect of your life, your personal life, your personal work with God. It also applies to the marital life. It applies to everything. There will be battles we will fight. The primary battle will be against your faith. That's why the shield is a shield of faith. That's the primary thing. So the enemy will try to take away your trust in God and his word. But how does faith come? How do you build a shield? Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Not by praying, by hearing. I believe the faith that is your shield is the faith, the trust you have come to have in God. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, is the word of God that is revealed to you in the present about each situation you're facing and that you're putting to use. So if the Lord says, rebuke the it's, it's an evil spirit, rebuke it. If the Lord says, forgive him. If the Lord says, go to him and say, I'm sorry. If the Lord hints you, give him, give her. That money. Whatever the Lord is saying to you per time and you act on it, that is the sword of the Spirit. That is you swinging the sword of the Spirit. And it's not just when it looks like a threat to your life that it is warfare. It is warfare. 
when he says give that girl money and you give her, give that guy the money in your pocket and you give it. That's warfare. How? Oh, that guy was going to go to his a sugar mommy's house or call a sugar mommy. He used to have some wrong relationship with an older woman long before. He was going to send her a message that night and say, um, well done, man. He had tried to break away, has been trying to live a Christian life, but he's going to reach out and that will begin the possibility of his almost falling again. If you had given him that money, he wouldn't have reached out. It is warfare. You don't need to know the details of warfare. You just obey the voices. You obey the voice of the Lord per time. It may not come like a voice. It may come like a, you, you just, I should, or you head up. However, this is how you, we fight. Christians don't fight by shouting. Seven, hallelujah. One, if that's what the voice says, the Lord leads, that's, then that's warfare. Do you understand? Like Joshua and the wall of Jericho. But if he doesn't say it and you keep it as a, a method, you're wasting time, you're just shouting. Maybe it's voice practice. Warfare is a collection of acts of obedience to God. This is the most effective warfare. Once in a while, the warfare gets intense and you have to put in extra effort. Okay. But know that what you learned before will help you win your battles. Amen. So I have no idea what I just preached. All I know as usual is that God loves people very much. And he has hijacked the whole message and given you. Now I've told you my problem with people. When God is loving you, you keep on being stupid. If you like, be stupid. Don't use what I just told you. That runs. Hey, that's your. I mean, it's nothing I can do. Uh, see, I'll still. God will put it down. I told her. I told. I made everybody become a spectator. Sit down. Look at the preacher. Look at all the. See the place I put. I haven't read one line. If I had my way, I would still preach it. Questions? Oh yeah, you have questions. Ask it quickly. Raise your hand. Let the microphone come to you. Wave your hand till the microphone comes to you. If you have questions about everything I said about warfare, after I answer this one, you can ask it. If you want to write it, write it in, send it quickly. Give it to an usher. I would suggest you ask questions about the topic you just had. Take it, hold it well, because it will apply to a degree on the Monday meeting. 7 a.m. in the morning, come early, be here. We will go to warfare concerning marriage matters. There are people that should be married that are not. There are people that are near to be married that should get ready. There are people that are not to marry. It doesn't matter. Eventually, someday, you may be married. It's good you know how to prepare in your lifestyle, in your, in whatever. A good part, chunk of what I said can apply to that. That's what that meeting is for. So it's unique, different from the other ones which I give general counsel. This is different. This one we are going to war. Because there are some people that there's old and bad things that you open the door. Your, your disobediences may have opened the door. The enemy has gotten all sorts of permission. He has asked like they asked for Peter to sift you. And you are being sifted. Now, what did Jesus say? He didn't say, Peter, they prayed for you. It's nothing we can do. He said, no, I've prayed for you. But he didn't say, I, I rebuked it and chased it away. He said, I've prayed for you that your faith might not finish. It means he was still sifted. But the prayers helped him come out victorious. Is this clear? That's how, where prayer comes in. All right. So some of you, there's permission to sift that has already been on your head. And we want to Help you come through it. Please don't invite people much. We we'll have other ones wherever God allows. I wanted to cater to our people. I was planning to make it private. I didn't even want new people to hear that. Well, God said we shouldn't be selfish. So. If you know you're new, you're a first timer, and you're inviting your friend, you're new, or even the older people. Tell them to come. Tell them it starts by seven. Don't say anymore. Their nature will handle the rest. Have you heard? 
I would have said you should tell them to come by eight. But not in seven. Don't stress it. Don't say come on. Hey, don't say help. Don't say there's a meeting. Yeah. All right. Based on the replication of the divine you spoke of earlier, I recently saw a church carry a replica of the Ark of Covenant on the streets as people follow while praying. Is it right? Answer yourself. Is it right? Sometimes some of you, you just want to gist. You just want to tell us someone carried the Ark of Covenant. We've heard you. What kind of question is it right? How can it be right? But on the other hand, is it you that paid for it? Leave people to make what they want to make. I, mean, I wish I could see it. Why didn't you take a picture now? I'd like to see how it looks. Ah, uh -uh, Inuyo. Ah, uh ah. -uh. You didn't take a picture. Please, if you find it online, send it to me. I want to see. That's nice. Ask them if they could give us for illustration purposes. I only need a picture now. So nice. Okay. Is it right? What is the question? What's your problem? What is your business? Leave people alone about Should you do it? If I see you do it, you explain. Let's say you leave and go and do it. So this, hey, let me answer well, I beg. Let's say you say no, but I asked him that time. Now remember 2023. And he said that there's no problem. You ex when you see God, you explain what you want. These things were done before Jesus came to give an illustration. People were not even allowed to see this thing after they put it in there. They were never allowed to see. It. Do you know that? You don't. God allowed them to carry it whenever they were moving. That's when it came out. Other than that, it was completely hidden. Only the high priest could see it once a year. The high priest, who is a picture of Jesus, saw it once a year. That's the only time he could enter the Holy of Holies. Once a year. Only he saw it. Only he went in here. One human being saw this thing. Once a year. Then when they would move in the wilderness, when they would move, the priest would carry it on his shoulder. But many times they would wrap it when they move it. However, when they were crossing Jordan into the promised land, they carried it on their shoulders. And it parted and went before them. Arise, O Lord, and he would lead them. They would say a prayer. And he would lead them to where they were going. So the Lord would show himself when he's taking them somewhere. Then he'll hide again. Because the Bible tells you that he's a God who hides himself. Is this clear? Next question. How do you balance Bible study and prayer during morning devotions? You can. Again, I can't give you a fixed format. In our morning devotions in my house, the Bible reading takes longer. Why? Because we've been going through chapters of the Bible. But it depends. There are times when it might be equal. There are times when they are praying and worshipping and praising. And it might last for 30 minutes, 40 minutes. And the Bible time might be 15, 20. But the hour time is much more common that the Bible time might be up to 30 minutes to an hour. And the devotion, the praise and worship and prayer that follows that might be 10, 15 minutes. Um, so don't look for a fixed format. If there's an issue that needs prayer more, then you might pray more. And so it's just that the church does need a lot of study because they don't know much at all. If you're in my house and you're reading through, like we've been doing for a while now, from Genesis we began, and you're reading a chapter, almost a chapter a day, it will take a while before you finish the chapter. Now. And then sometimes we ask, different people will share. Different people that have something they saw can share. It can be short, it can be fast, it can be longer. Okay, so just do the two. Just try and do the two. But there are times, like in the evening, when we're having devotions, this morning devotions, we ask, okay, our uh, evening devotions, we don't share scriptures. We just give thanks. As people are giving thanks, that amounts to prayer, too. Though you may not realize it. Okay.
triggered the fasting and praying lifestyles of Christians around? Well, there's some argument. All right, so there are some manuscripts from where this the Bible was translated to English. Some manuscripts, some original manuscripts don't contain that. Some say this can only go out by prayer. So they believe that um, some things were added. And they try, some people say, no, this, this was not there in the original. Okay. Others say, no, that there are certain demons that they must be preparation, fasting and prayer preparation. Okay. What would I say? Now, if you speak just from reading the Bible, certain things, uh, you, you can keep arguing about it. Then if you have experience in some things, if you've experienced casting out demons, sometimes the thing is that, I mean, I even had a, some minister, whom I, I respected, who said that, that is, I knew them already, knew about them, and they said that the person fasting is the person that has the demon. They weren't joking, very serious individuals, very serious. So they put you, they had the demon on the fast. I mean, I like that one. Are you not the one with the demon? What kind of thing is that? So I'll now, now come and eat because you have a demon. If you like, don't fast. You carry your demon and go home. Do you understand? All right, so I don't mind. I don't mind. Uh, what's my experience? My experience is that I... What can, this was an epilepsy demon, very terrible thing. I haven't dealt with an epileptic demon yet in my life, so I don't know. I'm just saying that whether it was not there in the original and it was added, or whether it is it doesn't go out except by prayer, talking to God ahead. Question, when did Jesus pray? Well, Jesus had been up the mountain praying with James, Peter, James, and John. Then he came down and saw this demon. His disciples had been down here. Casting out demons, God was using them, but this demon they couldn't handle. They were experienced with deliverance, but so it seemed there was an extra thing. And the Lord Jesus said some things. He said things like, "You people will not believe until you see. Bring the child to me." In another rendition, he told the father, "He said, do you believe?'" The man said, "Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief." And so on. Maybe I should have read. When I'm answering some of these questions like this, I'm not being thorough enough. So in Matthew 17 and in Luke 18, well, in Matthew 17, they asked him in verse 17, after the man said, I brought him to your disciple and they couldn't heal him. And verse 17, he said, oh, unbelieving and perverse generation. Do you see that? You hear him say unbelieving. What is he implying? Who is unbelieving here? Is it his, go back to verse 16. Is it his disciples that are unbelieving? Or is it, I want to show you why. Because some of you, you know, you thought like, how can they be serious? It must be the faith. It must, the person that must fast and pray must be the who? must be the minister, the servant of God. But look at verse 17, we look at 18. He says, Jesus says, Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, how long must I remain with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Keep going. Then Jesus rebuked the demon. He came out of the boy and he was healed from that moment. Is that clear? Next verse. Afterwards, oh yeah, read. The disciples came to Jesus privately and asked, Why couldn't we drive it out? Keep going. Because you have so little faith, he answered. But truly, I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Have you seen that? Do you see what happened in this? In Matthew, do you see any mention of prayer and fasting? Answer me now. Do you see prayer and fasting there? First, he had said they had unbelief and they perverse. Then now he tells his disciples in private. 
your faith was so little. I think it was so little, it wasn't even the size of a mustard seed. It was too little. But the question is, ah, they had been doing this before, so what happened? They didn't have faith. How come they are doing something? Because faith is built up. There's an assurance in the heart that can come from having seen God do things, from having known God do things, from having experienced and heard God on a matter. There's a confidence that we can get to have, a faith that can come with time. You know very well a time came when Peter could walk past people and they will get healed. You know very well certain things happen later. But in this instance, whatever it is, they didn't have enough for it. So it means that you can have more of faith. Can you see this? Do you agree that there's a faith problem? I've always told you, even the fasting, you're doing all of that. The fasting, you don't fast as though demons are afraid of hungry people. You don't understand. If it was so, then hungry people would be the most anointed on earth. All right, so it's not the hunger the demon is afraid of. It is that when you're fasting and seeking the Lord, during that time, your faith will be building up if you're in the Word. Are you hearing me? Faith comes from hearing the words of God. So if you've been in the face of God, faith will build. Faith will build. All right? And uh, that's how that works. Now, if we look at, uh, I, I want to, sorry. I want to, um, so this was Matthew's uh, rendition. Let's look at Luke's rendition. Luke chapter 17. Luke 9. Okay, so just give me verse 41 to, oh yeah, you're reading for me, uh, from verse 41 to, um, oh well, just 43. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long must I remain with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. Even while the boy was approaching, the demon slammed him to the floor in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. All right, that's all that we have there. Now look at Mark chapter 9. Also, so it's Luke 9 and Mark 9, the same story, then Matthew 17. And, uh, uh, now it starts from verse 14, but uh, Mark 9, but we'll just read from verse 19 as usual. 19 to, ah, it's very long though, to 29. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long must I remain with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So you see, similar to Matthew's expression, yes? They brought him, the spirit cast him down, convulsion, keep going. So Keep they... going. Uh, now, when he threw him to the ground, the boy was thrashing around. Jesus asked his father, how long has this been with him from childhood? Do you see it didn't just go that there was a conversation? Take note of it because it's not many times this happens. Most times Jesus casts out demons with a word. He casts them out. But in the case of Legion, he stopped and had a discussion to ask him, how many are you? Or what's your name? You get that this is for a reason. This is not just uh, for fun, you know. And the father had uh, told him, you know, after telling him that since childhood, he went on to start begging him and telling him stories. Keep going. Uh -huh. Verse twenty-two said, "If you can help him." Verse twenty-three said, "If you can." Echo Jesus, all things are possible to him who believes. Next verse, the father cried out. I do believe. Help my unbelief. Now, do you see how this matches with what Matthew said when he said unbelieving and perverse generation? So there's a problem. Then later on, he tells his disciples it's because you lack faith. So there's a belief challenge that can is very real in dealing with, in carrying out the will of God. 
Immediately, the boy's father cried out, I do believe, help man believe, keep going. And then a crowd was coming and he rebuked the unclean spirit, told it to leave him and not come back. He still shrieked. He didn't just live quietly. He shrieked and convulsed him violently. The spirit came out. The boy became like a corpse. So that many said, he said, why is this so? Why is it so extreme? Why are some deliverances very extreme? Because demons can attach to, you know, when you're separating, you could use the word of, they say the host. When, when you're separating something that is very hard in its joining, it's more violent to separate it. Have you tried to tear off pick cellotape from a carton before? It carries away the part of the carton. It's then light on. Okay, so there's differences. There's attachments that are light. The attachments are very deep. This was a deep attachment. So much so that when he left the boy, he became like a corpse. Sometimes in casting demons out of people and delivering people, you've seen some, some takes days, weeks, months, gradually. Some is instant. Some, some are just very troublesome and some are lighter. Some are very easy. Some leave. Because there are different kinds of spirits. This kind of spirit, especially spirits that started afflicting people from childhood, can be very, very problematic. But there's nothing, you remember what he said, all things are possible to those who, those who believe. Okay? He, he did all that and the, he became like a corpse as though he was dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, helped him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why couldn't we drive it out? Now, here we come. Jesus answered, This kind cannot come out except by Great. prayer. Now, most translations will say this King James. Give us King James, verse 29. Mark 9, verse 29. will say, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. What is my conclusion? When I read and studied these things first, heard it, read Kenneth Hagin. I can't remember what he even said deeply on it. When I was reading books in 1998, 1999, 2000, and this 20-something years ago, I would probably in my mind go with fasting as a primary, I don't know. But I'm going to qualify. It's just that in my personal experience, I've probably cast out demons. Okay, I am in a difficult place. I can't answer this one. And there are people that won't take what I'm answering lightly. So you might be there thinking, well, let me just say anything. No, there are people that will hear me and <laughs> it could disrupt them. They could say, I won't listen to this man again. That's their, bad, that's their misfortune. Though, right? They could be unhappy. Let me put it this way. I've never thought of casting a demon out of someone and asked myself, did you fast? I don't connect the two. If I see a demon, it needs to be cast out. I cast it out. And they have never told me, you, you didn't even fast. They go. Hundreds of times. Okay, so... You can understand my challenge in answering it. Ah, no, you must fast before you come to cast it out. But I'm going to qualify. On the other hand, I've fasted in my life for years, but not for demons, but just fasting. I've told you what used to make me fast, to be with God. I want to be with the Lord. Not for power. I've told you I didn't used to fast for power like many Christians. I fasted because I'm saying today I'm going to fast and pray. I'm going to study my Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to be with God. It used to be Sundays. I just spoke about it some days, some weeks ago. On Sundays, and I would, after church meetings, I'll go to a quiet place, a private place in my parents' house in school, wherever I was, and say, this is God's Sabbath. This is God's time. And I would be fasting. I did that for 20-something years. So maybe that fasting contributes to the demons living. Do you understand? Maybe, okay, so if you insist on saying, no, you must fast, I've given you the fasting. Good. But if you're also saying, no, it must be the fasting you did for the meat, for that particular exorcism. 
maybe it is because why you don't hear me talk about fasting much is because I just don't also eat much. So I don't know how to say it well. So on average, I'm not eating. It's just I don't say I'm fasting. Okay, so you, you can see my struggle. So on average, on an average day, if I want to sound spiritual, I'll tell you I fast all mornings. Yeah, that's my normal. I live a fasted life. I, I, I fast mornings till afternoons. I have my meal from after 12. I fast from morning to 1, 2, or 3. Then I have my first meal around 1, 2, or 3. My daily. So I live a daily fast. That's if I want to sound spiritual. But I never say that. It doesn't occur to me that I'm fasting. I'm just hungry. I just haven't eaten. That's how I live in the past couple of years. Today I ate earlier. I ate around 10. I had to make sure I spot it for you. <laughs> it's around 10 but that's an exception once in 7 months once in 6 months once in but remember when I don't eat I don't think I'm fasting I'm not fasting even I'm not in my room praying throughout no I'm not just eating now I could eat but I don't eat early I eat later could that count as a fast I'm still saying this for those that insist that no you must live a hungry a fasted life Please let this count for me. Do not throw me away. <laughs> Is this clear? All right. So maybe my constant hunger has a part. I don't know. I doubt it. Why? Because I'm involved with I disciple the people I disciple because I did not tell them you must fast before we would have sessions of casting out demons. Some of them eat. Most of them they eat as a norm. Because I did not teach them to fast to cast out demons. And when they cast out the demons, they leave too. Again, I told you not to be angry now. So I can remove my hand from soup, you know, food. And pray for someone and rebuke demon. And it does, nothing in my mind says, you're not worthy. The demon, But who knows? It might not be this kind of demon. Do you understand? Just that none of the demons ever, t whatever, they generally leave. That's all I know. Okay? So, maybe a life that has fasted and prayed. Forgive me for not sounding spiritual. I'll try, I've told you, I've been promising, I'm going to be spiritual soon. <laughs> so, have I answered this a bit? I have I answered it? I hope nobody is too angry at me. It's my house to go and be fasting. You have demon. Pick one. Don't worry. When you come, God will help you. Imagine if someone came to and said, Sir, have you been fasting? So what wait till I carry? What I'm carrying is, is, is thick. <laughs> I think the important thing is that the demons leave. And by the grace of God, we've seen the demons leave. We've seen the demons go, 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 go. Okay? God is faithful. My NIV here says the same thing. Almost every other translation will say by prayer. What prayer? I think a lifestyle of prayer. Again, does it mean that? Because I've told you, we don't even pray to demons. You cast out demons. You pray to God. When you pray, pray after this man, our Father. You pray to the Father in heaven. What do you do with demons? You cast out demons. You don't pray to demons. I've thought on this. I've explained it. Don't stand in front of someone, a demon, and say, uh, Oh God, please remove this demon. No demon goes like that. You talk to the demon directly. Shh, come on here. Get out. Leave. That's you and the demon. You talk to God. Father, help this sister. Lord, give us instruction. Is it immediately? When did Jesus stop there and pray? He didn't stop and pray. But he had been praying up on the mountain. Yes? So I think a lifestyle that involves prayer, that is mixed in with prayer, helps tremendously. Is this clear? Any other question? What does one do? What does one do if out of disobedience you stop getting instruction from the Holy Spirit and you've repented but still haven't been hearing God as often as you used to? As often as you used to. That means you're still hearing. Continue being obedient and it will increase. Always, God is kind and good. Don't bother about God's sight. Just 
love God, keep loving him, obey him. He's slow to anger. Keep obeying him and he will restore and he may even be better than before. The most important thing is how you live and your choices. Is there another? Is it possible to receive instructions from God different from the ones your shepherd or pastor has your shepherd has given you? If yes, what should be my response? Disobey God. <laughs> uh, sorry. Is that not the answer you want? I'm trying to be friendly. So God talked, your pastor talked. You are sure it's God that talked and you're asking what your response should be. So I'll follow you and enter trouble. The only thing that's happening here, please, for those that take everything literally, I was joking. Is it possible to receive instructions from God that are different from the ones your pastor has given? Absolutely. Your pastor or your shepherd or your disciple may miss it. And it can be God. The question is, what should you do? Talk, tell them that this is what I believe God told me. Is it possible? Look, should it be possible? No. Is it possible? Yes. What should you do? Try asking that same God that talks to you so clearly now. Why do you come and ask me? I'm a pastor and a shepherd. I might be biased. Ask the God who spoke to you. His answer might be different from mine. He may tell you, go and obey your pastor. For now. So, your your. God could tell you, I want you to speak with people on the street. See, this your question is, is not a short answer. And I've answered it in the past years. God could tell you, I want you to share my word. Let me give you a classic example. Share my word for souls are dying. And you say, Lord, how many should I share with every day? Say, every day, no less than five. Good. So you step out to obey that. Every day I'll speak to at least five people. Then your pastor announces, everybody, we are going to be in church from morning till evening for the next three days. A typical child who does not understand how God speaks will say, I would have come for that meeting, but I can't because God already told me to go out and preach to at least five people a day. When I finish preaching to five people, I'll come. Are you hearing this? Are you hearing? God told him, at least five. If he was more mature in understanding, he would know that if God led his church, his pastor, to call for a meeting and people will be here from morning to evening for three days. That it doesn't counter his preaching to people, five people a day. Or is he saying on the day of his wedding, he'll post it and go out and preach to five people? Are you saying if you're in a plane traveling from here to Amsterdam, you post the flight, go down and preach to five people? Okay, you can preach on the flight. Okay, are you saying they lock you up in a prison cell? Only you are inside. You break the metal rod and preach to five people? It's called context. And that is why it's best to talk with your pastor about this leading you think is contradicting. Do you get? If it's a situation that is necessary. Now, there are things that there's no question. The Bible says something and your pastor is saying something else. Not that type. But there are these things that are not clashing. It's just that, oh, your pastor said, I want you to come and follow me. We need to go somewhere. And he says, sorry, sir, I can't come. The reason being, is this thing God told me to do. And that is, I must preach to five people. Meanwhile, where he's taking you, you may go and preach to 50 people. But you see, there's, because your, your mind works like a child. So you're like, no, I, I know what God told me. I know what God told me. I've had people, remember I'm a pastor, I've seen them, and the, the reason why they may not be here now, they should be here. They are not here because they believe they are doing something God told them. How you know that what they had has K-leg is the quality of life or what they are doing, how it is going. The fruit makes you wonder, say, I thought you said God. If it's God, why? They are the ones that say God told me, so they leave. But they are having all sorts of challenges. I'm not saying when you obey God, you have challenges. I'm saying that the result, okay, it's God that told you, but you keep falling into a deep pit. It's God that told you, and you keep having so many issues. 
And sometimes they will even come back to you and say, help me, help me. And I keep wondering. I thought you say God told you. This is not how it works when God tells someone something. Now I'm a nice guy, so I, I won't rub you in your face. But I wonder. Some leave and say, God said I should go to the other place and be. And then they, when they have problems, they leave there and come to me. And I'm like, the person that you say God said you should be on that, you didn't tell him. He said, no, the person doesn't have the ability to handle these kinds of issues. How many of you can understand my confusion? Is it the God that sent you? You didn't know. Why would God send you to someone that can't take care of you, handle your issues? There must be a reason. I think, and it's often the case, it happens especially with males. It happens with females, so it happens with males. When the people have a chance to go to a place where they can exercise power and authority, they like being there. When you go to a place where they say, sit down and hear the word of God. Sit down. They tend to want to hear something else. They want God to say they should do something else. It's usually mostly matters of authority. You can be in a place and God wants you to do something and you can do it through the leader. But let me teach you something else again. You learn these things as you mature. That thing God told you to do, he may not mean for you to start doing it for the next two years. But you simply don't know. These are things we learn from experience too. Yeah, you under a burden to do. God, oh God, I'm not obeying God. I've not done it. I've not done it. Two years later, three, is when it's perfect. And you look back and say, Kai, what if I'd done this before now? You would have felt woefully. God usually starts telling people things ahead of the time. If it's not a sin, he starts telling you ahead. He starts preparing your heart ahead. He puts it there, puts it there to your life. Oh God, I'm not obeying. But you step out and obey and things will align because that is the proper time. So it may be true that God spoke to you, but it may not be time. Your pastor may be the one to guide you till that time and then you'll be ready. So you may have heard many stories. You may have heard stories of servants of God talking about how God led them to do something. How God told them to do something and they were here and here and God and they thought it was to be immediately. Do you know people have gone out to start ministry because God spoke to them, gave them a vision. And then they go into a box for, for 15 years before they fulfill. People have seen visions. All of you saw that elderly man that came here and talked about seeing things he saw in 1973 in a vision as a young man being fulfilled in the last two years, the last year or so. After how many years? Nearly 40-something years. Something he thought would happen the next week when he saw it in 1974 as a student. So, I have learned it. There are many things that, oh God, and I, oh, 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 before it comes to birthing. So God comes first with his words as a seed and it begins to form within your belly. Again, a typical young person cannot believe it. And I don't blame you because I've been like you too. You think it's now, in the next two weeks, till God, till you realize this is not set and restraining me, it's God himself. You're like, why? How come he told me? He told you so it will start for me, gestating, till the perfection of time, the fullness of time. Amen? All right, let's just pray a word of prayer.